Today on In Grace, we're in Minneapolis to interview Timothy Mahoney, a filmmaker, to investigate, is the Bible true? Did the miracles in the Bible really happen? Ever since I was a boy, I've been fascinated with God's creation. I'm traveling the planet to tell his story about his world. I'm Jim Scudder Jr. Come with me on another exciting adventure in grace. I don't believe there was a single event that we can call the Exodus. So far, there is no documented evidence about the Exodus. Exodus did not happen in the way that it is described in the text. How can we prove that? You look for a collapse in Egyptian civilization, and that's where you'll find Moses and the Exodus. We're at the epicenter of the unrest in America. We're at the George Floyd Memorial. Right here, he died. And we're exploring the question, is there hope for the world? Is there hope for our problems? Are there really miracles? We're going to be talking to you, Timothy Mahoney, a filmmaker that did this investigation on the Exodus to see if the things in the Bible, the grand stories of miracles in the Bible were really true. And then we're gonna discover from that if the world today has any hope at all. So you have a film series, basically, Patterns of Evidence. And by the way, you start with the most ardent skeptic of what you're hoping to be true, the mm -hmm. Bible, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and you, you get right into it. I mean, uh, <laughs> I, I'm always amazed at that. You, I mean, you almost get hit by uh, Diva or whoever that just, you know, they just don't believe this is true. Yeah. And you start with that. So yeah. I think that's a, a good way to put it because now, you know, puts people that believe the Bible a little bit on their heels. Like, oh, I didn't know someone really doubted the Bible that much that was so highly thought of in academia. Right, and so what has happened then is that, you know, as I was building it on multiple sides, what I could see was that that gave it strength. Because if you only give uh, an audience one point of view, they're actually kind of still hanging on to a couple of different things. They're, they're not really free. Uh, some, some people that already believe something are comfortable with, you know, they, they just feel like they're affirmed in what they already believe. But if you're dealing with people that aren't sure, or if you're dealing with, a lot of people love our films because they can be shared with people who don't believe. Mm -hmm. Because I've learned, and you've interviewed a lot of people, is that there's the first question, there's the second question, and then by the time you get to the third or fourth question, as to explain to me how you arrived at this understanding that you have, sometimes people have to then reveal that they might not have arrived at that with any basis other than I was told this was by taught. my, I was taught this. Mm -hmm. And that's when we started talking about in the Moses controversy that there's paradigms, that there's information that gets passed down from one, from teacher to student. And that happens a lot. Yeah. And I think, was it, uh, who was it in Jerusalem? A, a woman that worked for Hebrew University. She said, I couldn't even consider your theory because my hero, my, my teacher, would roll over in his grave. This is, this is sad. Sad, this is sad. Yeah. It's, it's not science. I mean, this is, uh, excuse me for using the very blunt words here, this is disseminating fake uh, knowledge and fake science to people. It's not their field. You can tell me, for example, any stories in you know, biology, uh, mathematics, and I will believe because I don't know. Yeah. And really, if my great teachers, Joseph Nouvet, would be alive, he, I think he would die again if he were here. Charlie Goldwasser, uh, who was also a language expert with the proto sinaitic uh, language, you know, uh, uh, she actually had a, her own theory. You know, she felt that, that people who were uneducated were the ones who, you know, invented this. Mm. But then when I talked with a professor from uh, Penn State University, uh, Donald Redford, and but he was telling me, well, we think this happened at a virus. Mm. And this is where Manfred Vitek was suggesting that people were looking at it, but these might be the, the early Israelites in this area. So something was happening in this area, and people have different names for it, 
but there's something that was going on there. And that's why when we look at that, we could say, well, what if the alphabet wasn't just a happenstance invention by, you know, slaves, but what if God actually gave the alphabet to his people, the Israelites, as a way for them to communicate and record what God was doing. The thinking is that if Moses didn't write at the time of the Exodus, then this part of the Bible and its account of God giving revelation to mankind was an oral tradition and more vulnerable to changes and exaggerations with each telling of the story. And if that happened, it would no longer be a trustworthy account. But surely, widespread literacy wasn't required for Moses to write the Pentateuch, since scribes in Egypt and ancient Mesopotamia wrote all the time without a large reading audience. However, as I read the book of Deuteronomy, I saw that a wider literacy was essential for the Israelites to understand and preserve the revelation given to them in the books of Moses. It recorded that Moses told the heads of Israelite households to write the words of the law on the doorposts of their homes and on their gates so they could teach them to their children. What we end up finding, you know, is that film, The Moses Country, started to realize. And I remember waking up in the, you know, in the morning and thinking, wait a minute, what if the alphabet's not just a coincidence, but it's actually given to us by God for one purpose? to uh, retain the knowledge of God. So the Israelites would have been the first to actually have that, and that's exactly what we start seeing at the very location where uh, we think the Israelites lived as, you know, when they became enslaved. These inscriptions start showing up that appear to be a form of early Hebrew. Unlike the alphabet, cuneiform and Egyptian hieroglyphics had nearly a thousand signs. They were so complicated to learn that only the scribes, priests, and kings could use them. In contrast, our alphabet today has 26 letters. Imagine how much harder it would be to have to learn four of our alphabets rather than one. But to learn hieroglyphics, one would have to learn the equivalent of 40 alphabets. That's one thing that made the alphabet so revolutionary. And with a simple to learn yet powerful alphabet, it would have been possible to teach large numbers of Israelites to read and write. With a non-alphabetic system, this would have been impossible. I wasn't planning at all on making a film about the Moses controversy. I actually feel that probably that that film about the early form of the, al the early alphabet is one of the most important, most significant films I could have ever made in my life. He went to Jordan and hire, hired a bunch of people to be, you know, actors. And yep. and I heard, uh, I, I watched a, a little behind the scenes thing and it, you had a windstorm that just knocked down all the tents. And, you know, it was almost just this big disaster. But the person watching would never know because right. it just comes off so awesome. But yeah, what happened to us, we did. We, we actually had, I thought it was going to be one of the greatest locations and scenes for the Israelites and we, we paid extra to have these tents and had all these people there and then a windstorm came and blew everything to pieces and uh, literally because those tents are big they're like a sail and you have to get them down quick uh, and um, so I said what are we going to do I, you know because I realized I mean I had prayed for that what would happen would be the right thing there's a little valley and I said bring everybody over to the valley and so I got a lot of the young kids and the actor who played Moses. And we sat in that valley and we filmed scenes with him talking to the, to the children. And as it turned out, that was a very, very significant scene that wasn't on my list mm. of scenes. Uh, and, um, and you know, we were able to, to accomplish that. I ended up going back to Jordan a, a, another time uh, to film again. And so I've, tr I've given it a few tries, you know, uh, <laughs> trying to learn from my mistakes. And I think it's important for people to see recreations. Yeah. Uh, if you just talk about it or you use some type of picture from a, a painting in a museum, it doesn't have the same impact. Can you believe that most scholars don't believe the Exodus even happened? You need to watch Patterns of Evidence, The Exodus, to find out how wrong they are. 
for a gift of $16.95 or more, you will receive a DVD copy of the critically acclaimed film, Patterns of Evidence, The Exodus. Call now, 800-78-GRACE, or visit ingrace.tv to get your copy. Even the release of the last film has been delayed because of the world's you know, situations. But even there, you can see God involved in just even the ending of your film. Well, what happened was that, as you mentioned, that we were supposed to have this new film, The Red Sea Miracle Part Two, uh, out uh, in May. And uh, the world changed and theaters were closed and we weren't able to do that. And when we started to think about The Red Sea Miracle as a film, um, well, what I, one thing I knew is that, boy, this was going to be a complicated uh, film to try to make. Because if you really do the research and you look at a lot of things, there are areas within the narrative of the Bible. The biblical account that says that the Israelites leave Egypt, they cross the desert, they get told they're supposed to turn and detour to a sea, and then the Egyptians trap them there. Mm -hmm. And so in the, the two films that we've created, Red Sea Part 1 and Part 2, we look at crossings, what we call the Egyptian point of view, which is near Egypt mm -hmm. at the lakes. Uh, we, we did look a little bit at the Suez, which is considered near Egypt. And then uh, we look at the Gulf of Aqaba. And these two gulfs are part of the Red Sea. They come up in a V, and in between that V is the Sinai Peninsula. So as we're investigating this, I thought, well... We've got to look at these different crossing places, but how do you do that? You know, and that's the reason why it be, had to be come into two films. Mm -hmm. And it's you know when you combine the information, it's it's over four hours of of investigation. And um, so in the new film, and one of the one of the themes, and I think about about themes and about what I would call threading or, or weaving. The, the films have storylines, and there's a weave to them. And one of them is, it's called the Red Sea. So what is the Red Sea? Is it the Red Sea? Is it the Reed Sea? You know, is it near Egypt? Is it at the Gulf of Aqaba? How did we get to this place? All these questions have big ramifications because if it's the, you call it the Egypt model or Egypt approach, it, uh, it would be s s rather small, mm -hmm. almost, you know, humanly explained mm -hmm. events. But if it's, farther and the Gulf of Aqaba, mm -hmm. it's it's deep water, it's an ocean, it's mm -hmm. a, it's what you would see in the, the Cecil B. DeMille's uh, Ten Commandments films. It's the massive, and that's what I've always, I mean, just natural reading of the Bible, it's big. It's a miracle that God is doing, or a series of miracles. Yes. Then the other part of the the name of the film is, is called, you know, Red Sea Miracle. And, and so as you look at that, then you ask the question, well, was the parting of the sea a big miracle? Or was it a little miracle? One thing I've discovered in this investigation is that there are two main approaches that explain this event in very different ways. The first I call the Egyptian approach. It sees the events of the Exodus happening on a small scale and puts the sea crossing at one of the swampy lakes near Egypt's border. Those using this Egyptian approach tend to explain the parting of the waters by natural forces, such as wind. This is by far the majority view among scholars today. The second view I call the Hebrew approach. It sees the events of the Exodus on a much larger scale and places the miraculous sea crossing far from Egypt at the Red Sea's Gulf of Aqaba. This is because they emphasize the entire narrative of the Bible which they believe geographically points to this location and describes a big miracle that could only be explained by the power of God. And then someone said, what are you saying? Well, what I'm saying is that did God cause the wind to blow at the right time in an Egyptian point of view so that a shallow body of water in a natural way was sort of pushed aside and allowed the Israelites to pass and then the wind stopped blowing and the, and the water came back. That's the Egyptian approach. And slowly killed the whole Egyptian army, right? Well, it, well, it would come back at a kind of a, yeah. it would come back out of the way, but you know, there is no walls of water. Right. And yeah. the Bible says it was two walls, walls. of water. Yeah. And that has been the unusual thing because water doesn't stand up in a wall. It might get, you know, like a tide, it might be like 
pulls out, but it would be a if long, it's a wall, it's a moving wall. Right. right it'd, yeah. be, it'd be a moving wall. It'd be like a big tidal wave, mm -hmm. you know, coming in. So then the question is: is how are we to read the the, the text? You know, is it, it? And then that basically then raises questions for any other miracle because it says that there was a pillar of fire. Uh, at night, and there was a pillar of cloud by the day that was leading them. When Moses took the Israelites into the wilderness, it was a serious problem because the faith that he had to have that God was going to provide for all these people, and you know the tension between how many Israelites were there? Was there 5,000, 10,000, 15,000? The Bible says there was over 600,000 men, and that included the women and children. Where in the world did they get their water? Where did they get their food? Uh, these are serious questions. And after Jill and I went into the Negev and spent that time there, all of a sudden I had a whole new understanding of how serious this was for, for Moses uh, to have actually pulled it off. I mean, by faith, taking these people into the wilderness. And what do they say to him when he's at the sea crossing? Did you bring us out in the wilderness to die? To die. Were there no graves in Egypt, you know? <laughs> and that wasn't the only time that mm -hmm. they gave him grief. Right. So uh, what a man, what a man he was uh, to be able to do it. And he first said, you know, I can't do it. You know, I, Lord, I can't, I can't speak, I stutter, whatever. And mm -hmm. So it, he was God's man, though. Mm -hmm. And he, he finally said yes, and <laughs> yeah. God let him every step of the way. Yeah, and I think that that is the big challenge for us, isn't it? Uh, is to basically... Uh, I mean, people, all of us, I believe, might have a moment when we have a burning bush experience and uh, where we basically are uh, seeing something, you know, we think we're kind of on our own and there's this mission that you're put on. And I think uh, that what happens is that most of us can sometimes say, I can't, I'm not capable of that. Exactly what Moses said. He says, I'm not capable of doing this. I think oftentimes sin is more about what you're what you were supposed to have done, mm -hmm. not always what you did that was wrong. Mm -hmm. But agree. there's a lot of people that are supposed to be doing things, mm -hmm. and they just said, "I can't do that." They don't have any faith that they can do that, and I think that's what's really I think different for me is that if you kind of get on the other side and you go, "Well, I don't know if I can do that, but I'm going to try," and I think that that's what my encouragement would be for a lot of people. If I look back at and said, you're going to go to all these places, you're going to film these people, I would say, there's no way I can do that. But I, I, I do believe that you have to just say, well, I'm going to try. And that's all we've been doing is ask, saying, I think I'm going to try. Tim, we're down in the epicenter of the latest crisis, yeah. the real crisis in our country. And you see the people that are hurting in this world. It's yeah. real pain. Right. It is. And, uh, you know, I, I grew up in this area. Uh, this is my old neighborhood. Uh, you know, I used to ride my bikes through, you know, or all around here. What are you feeling when you see these buildings uh, just down here that are burnt to the ground? Well, it's sad because there's a lot of people who had nothing to do with this, that now their buildings, their businesses are destroyed. Their families are in crisis now. So that's the challenge is that and if we talk about the brokenness of the world, uh, one thing leads to another. And that's why, you know, in the Red Sea Miracle, you know, as I was making that film, what we realized is that there are some things that only God miraculously can, can restore. You know, the question of redemption is really what the, the, the uh, biblical account is. Well, the, one of the greatest miracles in the Bible, as far as just scope and size, would be the parting of the Red Sea. Mm -hmm. But here we have a a dilemma in our country, you know, a lot of history, a lot of problems and real issues. Mm -hmm. it, it seems like it's <laughs> the only way to solve it. It's not programs. It's not politicians. You know, it's not money. What's going to solve this crisis has to be a miracle. Yeah, that's right. And that's, that's what I've come to realize is that, you know, and, and the, the attached to miracle is the word prayer. Mm. If you don't have prayer, uh, you're not going to be able to see miracles because miracles are things that that I think you have to ask for. You have to pray and ask God for, for help and bring redemption. And so where are the solutions? Everyone's looking for a Messiah, right? Mm. Uh, the, the Jewish people are looking for a Messiah, the Muslims are looking for a Messiah, the Christians are looking for the Messiah, and regular people are looking for a political Messiah. 
And that's what the, the Bible is about, is that God, the kingdom of God is coming and there is a Messiah who can solve these problems. There is hope. There is a God. There are miracles. The greatest miracle is the salvation of a soul. Let me show you something real quick before we go. This is you and me. This is sin. We all have it. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Jesus had no sin. He was made sin for us. He took our punishment on the cross when he died and rose again. He paid for all of our sins. And when we put our faith in him, we have eternal life. That is the hope of the world. And Jesus died for all people. God bless you. Join us next time for In Grace. Can you believe that most scholars don't believe the Exodus even happened? You need to watch Patterns of Evidence, The Exodus, to find out how wrong they are. Millions of people wandering in the wilderness for 40 years? The giant walls of Jericho fell down? An entire army buried at the bottom of the Red Sea? Bring these biblical accounts to life as filmmaker Timothy Mahoney presents convincing new evidence that clearly matches the biblical account of the Exodus. For a gift of $16.95 or more, you will receive a DVD copy of the critically acclaimed film, Patterns of Evidence, The Exodus. I'd encourage you to order Patterns of Evidence, The Exodus today. And when you order from In Grace, you're also supporting us as we bring you great, adventurous, and Bible-affirming TV shows. Call now, 800-78-GRACE, or visit ingrace.tv to get your copy. You definitely want to set your DVR and record every single In Grace episode. Don't miss one of them. You will be so blessed as we learn all about God's world and God's Word. In Grace is a viewer-supported ministry. Thank you for your prayers and gifts.